Well, I'd like to welcome whoever is watching me back to another Friday where I will hold forth. Uh, if any of you noticed, and I'm sure any is a small number, and I'm not sure any noticed, but I had skipped a week last week, and that was because the whole last weekend was taken up with my celebrating my 90th birthday. And it was really a wonderful weekend. I was with family, friends, colleagues, all kinds of people. And it just felt so good to still be here, to be functioning, uh, to be the recipient of the kindness and attention of so many nice people. And just to have a delightful weekend without cares and uh, just enjoying the fact that life was continuing. And I hope I can keep it going for a long time to come. So today's my first day back. Somebody asked me recently, how long do I think I'm gonna have Friday lectures available? And I took a look at where I was going and I know for sure I have seven, eight, nine more that I already know the content of. What happens after that, I don't know, but I, I, I stand at a fork in many roads and I'll figure out which fork I'm gonna take after that, after I've finished with all the material I know I wanna talk about. So uh, starting a couple times ago, I began to talk about cases where I had relied upon what I used to call intuition and now simply call attunement to the client and my interactions and what's getting stirred in both of us by interacting with each other to come up with something to do about a case that I was lost in. I didn't know how to handle it, where to go, what to do about it. And I simply trusted whatever imagery would rise in me about unusual things I might do or say. And I emitted them and I went with them. And these are stories about what happened and what I got myself into doing that. So let me go again to screen sharing. Share. There. You should be able to see the document I had created, Novel Interactions with Clients. Uh, I'm still on the first page of, no, it's a one page document. I'm still up at the, towards the beginning of this document. Uh, I put brackets around things I've already presented and uh, I'm saving the very first one for the last because it's the most extensive and complicated of my excursions into unknown territories. So I'm working my way down. Today, I'm gonna to talk about handcuffing a child molester to his bed. <laughs> God, I'm even shaking my head when I'm thinking about the title. So let me put brackets around it now because I'll know that that's where I left off. This is going to be the most recent one. All right, I'll save that and I will stop screen sharing and just talk to you. Uh, this one's uh, somewhat easy to present because uh, it, it is going to be a chapter in the book that I will never get finished. And I have at least the first half of the chapter already written. So I, all I need to do is read to you and then talk extemporaneously about where I leave off in the written narrative. I put a tentative title on this called A Confused Descent into Anger and Revulsion describing myself and my reactions to this case, anger and revulsion. And then I backed way up into irrelevant things. I learned at a very young age that I was smart. In the first few months of my having been enrolled in kindergarten, my mother became concerned that the curriculum was not attuned to my capabilities and was a waste of time for her brilliant son. She requested that I be given an IQ test. The principal agreed to the assessment. To this day, I can still remember the hour or so I spent responding to the items on the Stanford Binet test of intelligence. I had fun. After my answers had been scored, the school authorities agreed with my mother that it would be best to advance me. So I found myself skipped into first grade the second semester of that kindergarten academic year. Over the years of my childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood, 
I was voraciously hungry for learning. I was also gifted or cursed with a scientist bent for evaluating all that I was being taught and all that I saw around me. As long as I can remember, I have been skeptical and unwilling to accept culturally formed messages about who I was and what I was to believe just because those concepts and ways of understanding existence were what I should absorb and embrace. Across my formative years, I was slowly engaged in a quiet rebellion, building my own values, my own beliefs, my hopes, my aspirations, and my understandings about how the world was organized, even if what I came to embrace set me apart from others. In young adulthood then, young adulthood then I had grown a youthful arrogance that I was special that what I had formulated for myself, deviant as it might be, was the correct way to believe it to be, and that I was a person who understood with a superior clarity almost everything that was troublesome for others to comprehend. By the time I was in the early years of my practice then, I was stressed to find that the career I was pursuing was immersing me in experiences that were challenging my hard-won conceptual structure, and the parts of that structure were beginning to collapse. The dissonance I was encountering was forcing me to learn yet another transcend transcendent piece of wisdom about my own life, wisdom I had never anticipated. And that truth was, I should never again permit myself to tell myself that my thoughts, behaviors, and choices for my conduct in the present moment and ongoing into my imagined future had been critically, successfully, and effectively shaped by me as a result of all my ruminations over the preceding years of my life. I thought I had formed my experiences into a hard-won set of enduring principles about what I was always going to believe, and I knew that that set contained what were a large number of stable and unchanging eternal verities. No, now I was experiencing quite the opposite. Instead, during my 30s, I was finding myself gradually throwing away my pompous surety that I was always going to accept do some particular things and that I would never accept do some other particular thing. Now I was finding myself lost in the process of reinterpreting or even abandoning portions of what I thought were hard-won truths, truths that absolutely defined me, and I was lurching into an exploration of thoughts and actions I had always believed were dangerous, odious, forbidden, stigmatizing, contemptible, outrageous, immoral, foolish, worthless, or even totally outside the realm of the conceivable. My encounters with the man I am about to describe, a man also in his 30s whom I shall call Ron, certainly challenged a set of my prior certainties. From the first moments of his coming into my life, his very being was a challenge to me, and he forced me to revisit and to question again a portion of my orienting convictions. You see, my calling is one that demands that I find some way to be responsive to and caretaking to those who seek me out. For Ron, though, even as simply having entered my presence, resulted in my immediately being confronted with how much I hated meeting him, what revulsion I felt hearing who he was, and how impossible it first felt even to consider the undertaking of any work with him. In the opening minutes of my spending time with him, I found myself angrily but silently cursing the fate that had sent him to me, and I was wishing he would disappear. I even questioned whether or not he deserved to live. All had begun simply enough. It was a Saturday morning. In the middle of that morning, there was a message waiting for my attention on my office answering machine. On it, a woman had recorded her request that I call her. Her voice sounded pressured, desperate. In her message, the caller described how she and her husband had just left the office of a colleague of mine. They were in a terrible crisis. 
My fellow psychologists had listened to the challenge they had presented to her and had to told them that she herself lacked the expertise to deal with the issues they were describing. She had recommended to the couple that they contact me forthwith, that I would be the proper person to aid them. My caller closed her message with telling me that, she had, that I had been very highly recommended and she also took pains to let me know how urgent it was for me to see them that day, if I possibly could. Yet the woman's words provided no details about the nature of the clearly anguishing difficulties in which the pair now found themselves immersed. I can often be a damn fool. One of the significant parts of my foolishness lies in my propensity to become a romantic, believing that there must be some mystical way that trivial events are somehow linked and that they in fact carry a deeper meaning or that they were helping being set my way for a hidden purpose by some magical force in the universe. As I listened to the voicemail for the second time, I found myself muttering to myself that the message was a sign that I had been chosen for something quite special. Most likely I was being offered an exceptional learning experience, one that I could only activate through my agreeing to heed the intensity of the woman's urgent plea and agreeing to grant her wish. I also told myself I should accept the flattery and appreciate the embrace and the confidence that had been placed in me by some unknown colleague who was now sending this challenge on to me. So I returned the call as soon as I heard it. I reached the woman and told her that I would see her and her husband at 4 p.m. that Saturday afternoon. I do not ordinarily work so late on weekend days, but I made an exception because I was expecting that I was about to have a unique experience. That part was accurate. I was certainly about to embrace an extraordinary challenge. Ron and his wife, let me now call her Pearl, arrived a few minutes early and I ushered them into my consulting space. In a pressured fashion, Pearl made the opening remark. I don't know what I'm going to do with my husband. And then she started sobbing so hard she could not continue speaking. Ron appeared to me to be somewhat far beyond crestfallen and his own tears started to find their way down his cheeks as well. And while his tears fell, Ron kept staring down at the carpet on my floor, avoiding making any eye contact with me in what I thought could only be a show of terrible shame. You two are clearly going through an agonizing time. It would help me if one of you could let me know what it's about, I answered. Ron gathered himself and lifted his gaze. I think I better be the one to tell you what I've done. With that, Ron told me almost more than I could bear. Here is his confession. It was delivered to me accomplished by his obvious hideous, lacerating and overwhelming shame. His description of his actions came in fits and starts, but he did proceed to fill me in on what had transpired in the early evening of the preceding day. Ron told me that he and Pearl had gone with their four-year-old son and one-year-old daughter to a birthday party at the home of Ron's brother-in-law and sister-in-law. The birthday party was in honor of his nephew, age five. The home was a large one in an affluent neighborhood and there were many, many other guests, extended family mother members and other family friends with many small children of their own. A magician had been hired to entertain the gathering. And when the performer had finished his show, a hot dog barbecue and the serving of a suitable birthday cake was to follow. After the magician's act ended, Ron noticed that his eight-year-old niece, Sally, the older sister of the birthday boy, got up to leave the living room to make a visit to the nearby restroom. Ron excused himself from those around him and followed her. He went on in a voice so muted I had to strain to hear. Sally and I are very good friends and we've always had fun together. I waited until she came out of the bathroom. I told her that before we both went to get our hot dogs, there was a little game I wanted to play with her. 
She was eager, so she followed me into a bedroom down the hall. A bunch of coats from the various guests were piled up on the bed. I pushed them aside and instructed her, now just lay down on your back on the bed and I'll show you the game. Sally happily obeyed me. When she was settled, I lifted her legs and pulled down her panties. I spread her legs apart and I stared and stared at her genitals. I said, oh, you're so pretty. Just a few seconds after that, my brother-in-law walked in. He was looking for someone's coat. He saw what was happening. He screamed at me, grabbed me, and threw me up against the wall. What are you doing? Get the fuck away from my kid. Who the hell are you? He turned to hug his daughter to pull her away from me. I got up and ran away from the room, ran back down the hall. I yelled at Pearl and our son, we've got to leave now, get in the car. Pearl could see something awful had happened. She swooped up her daughter, I pulled up my son, we ran to the car and I drove home like a maniac. My son was very frightened and started crying. While Pearl was trying to comfort him, she began to demand that I tell her what had happened and why we had to run. I was crying, I was a total wreck. I wanted to kill myself, my shame was so overpowering. I blurted out, I took off Sally's panties and was looking at her privates. Your brother came in and interrupted me. Pearl screamed. She cried and cried. She couldn't stop crying. I got us home somehow. As we came into our home, the phone began ringing. Pearl motioned to me to answer it. I was so terrified it was hard to move. It was my brother-in-law calling. I haven't figured out what to do with you yet, you fucking pervert bastard, but you better get your ass to a psychologist right away. You're a very sick man. You should be locked up and the key thrown away. But you shit, I don't want my Sally to get even more upset because of you and your rotten sickness. God damn it, is she gonna have to talk to the police? Will she have to show up in court and tell everyone what you did to her? I don't know if I'm willing to force her to go through that. And how can I have any goddamn peace knowing that my sister is married to a piece of shit pervert and that you're the one raising her two children with her? I hung up on him. I didn't know what to say. And I don't know yet what he's going to decide to do to me. So that's about it. That's what I did. That's why we're here. What's gonna happen to me? I certainly don't know what I'm supposed to do next. And then there's that voice of me that keeps telling me the best solution for everyone would be for me just to die. Dr. Kovacs, it was Dr. Shulman who sent us to you. When she heard what I've told you, she let me know that she wasn't the right one to help me or us. Is there any hope for me? Are you going to send me away too? Like Dr. Shulman, I too wanted to run. I wanted to hide. The story I had heard was detestable. I wanted to shriek at Pearl, get this sick bastard out of your life immediately. Go home and protect your children. Ron's gonna ruin you and ruin them. And maybe he already has. Instead, I stalled for time, trying to center myself. I was being asked for help. What the hell kind of help could I give? The propensity to molest was not curable. And who the hell was I supposed to help? Ron, Pearl? their marriage, their children. I also knew my legal and ethical responsibilities. I must report child abuse. I most likely wasn't going to see Ron anyhow. He was probably going to go to jail, maybe for a very long time. I stalled for a bit and asked Ron a question instead of finding an immediate answer to his query. No, I'm not gonna send you away, but tell me, did Dr. Shulman make a report of the incident to Child Protective Services? Ron told me she had not. Now I was not only aroused by the enormity of the challenge with which Ron was confronting me, no, in addition, a rage directed at my colleague also erupted in me. I thought that bitch, she knew her responsibility for reporting any child abuse, even suspected child abuse. And she just ran away and dumped this mess on me for me to deal with. God damn it, when I have a few moments, I'm gonna talk to her, tell her what I think of her and tell her if she doesn't get her act together and honor her responsibilities, I would sure as hell report her disgusting behavior to the Board of Psychology. I knew I had to do what Dr. Shulman had failed to do. So I started there. 
I said to Ron, Ron, I have no choice. I have to make a report by phone immediately to the Department of Child and Family Services about what you told me. It's my legal obligation and I can lose my license if I fail to do so. I don't know how DCFS is going to respond to what I'm going to say, but let's do that, do that now and get it behind us. I'll put the person on the line on the speakerphone here so you can hear the questions and the discussions we'll have. There may be some questions that the worker who answers our call may want to direct to you too. But the important thing is I'll be by your side and I promise I won't abandon you. I'll stay with you in the face of anything or everything that's directed at you. And I'll also see what I might be able to do to provide some comfort for your wife and children. I made the call. The child service worker wanted as many details of the event as Ron and I could possibly provide. Pearl cried silently every once in a while as she listened to the interview proceeding. A prime importance to the worker was that Ron's own children be kept safe from him. Ron repeatedly asserted that he had never done anything sexual with his own children. He sounded believable to me. In the end, we worked out a plan though that Ron would leave the family home immediately that afternoon and stay with a friend for the time being, at least until other planning might be done until the wheels of justice began to deal with him. Pearl had to promise the social worker that if Ron came by the home to retain, retrieve some belongings or to say hello to his children, she would not leave them alone with their father for even one minute. If she failed, she herself might be the object of criminal charges and or her offspring could be taken out of the home and placed in the foster care system. Ron, Pearl, and I were told that one or more social alert workers would be interviewing various of the participation, participants at the event. There was every likelihood the criminal charges would indeed be brought against Ron. The county social worker then asked me if Ron intended to work with me and if I was willing to have him as a client. Ron nodded yes, and I jumped off my emotional cliff and also assented in a soft and hesitant voice. The call ended with my telling the worker that I would begin seeing Ron twice a week. And if, the, if, they were, if he were to be incarcerated for some period of time, I would go to the jail and see him there if I could be permitted to do so. After we hung up for Ron's benefit, I added to my commitment, I'll be with you every step on the path ahead. I'll stay by your side. I'll do what I can to make sure that you're treated fairly, but some way you might keep your relationship with your children going forward. You have no reason to yet today, but maybe you might come to see that I can be helpful and that your fate matters to me. I don't know much about how your overwhelming, probably uncontrollable compulsion came to be but it's already apparent to me that there is, has to have been some terrible wounding deficit in your own past. It's more than likely that you never mattered sufficiently or properly to those who are supposed to have been caring for you. I assume that justice would not move swiftly. So I ended this first session by making two appointments for Ron in my schedule for the following week. And I helped the couple to work out the logistics of Ron's moving out of his home. His children would be told that his work was going to send their father out of town for most days ahead, but he would come and visit them as often as he could when he was able to be back in the city for short periods. And so began Ron's new life and also began my attempts to see if I could manage to do anything transformative with him. I contemplated the work ahead with a sense of futility, for I did not think that the odds of helping him to tame his hideous demons were much higher than nil. As I had anticipated, the legal process of dealing with the accusations against Ron ran on for months. There were many interviews with many persons. I had to provide a letter to the Department of Child and Family Services that my client had been keeping his appointments with me regularly. 
and seemed genuinely involved in using his sessions to explore his own hateful wounds and to be open and candid with me about whatever new revelations and disclosures were beginning to arise in the course of our work together. And this was not just a bunch of boilerplate that I was writing, just to fulfill some abstract responsibility. To my surprise, my tolerance for my hideously damaged client was slowly increasing, as was my sense that possibly, against all odds, something useful might come of our conversations. During those weeks in which the minions of our society were trying to arrive at a decision about what form of punitive response was to be made to the grotesque ugliness that was a deeply ingrained part of Ron's nature, Ron's brother-in-law had remained adamant that he would not subject his daughter to any inquisition nor would he ever allow her to be a witness at a trial. In the end, Ron's lawyer, Child Protective Service, and the DA staff all agreed to a plea bargain. There would be no trial. Ron would plead guilty, except for the rest of his life that he would register and be listed in our state's registry of sex offenders, and that he would serve a term of a year in prison. I was able to see Ron twice a week with regularity while the wheels of justice were grinding and Ron remained still free on bail. During those sessions, we were very engaged in three areas of discussion. The first two, his work life and his family life were needing urgent present attention in the real world. The third challenge were for us to come to sort of, sort of understanding about the story of his life particularly what had wounded him in such a fashion as to generate that those ways in which Ron was tormented. Of course, as our work proceeded in all three areas, I was also frequently preoccupied what, if anything, could be the sharing of the words that constituted our conversations with each other uh, to aid Ron bringing about any diminution of his hideous, hideous drive one so laden as it was with anxiety, guilt, and self-loathing, and the drive to undress little girl and to stare at their genitals. During those early weeks, Ron frequently asked if Pearl could come to his sessions. At times like this, I trust my clients. I believe there is some important wisdom in such requests. I should grant them, and I will be given the privilege of learning some things I could not have glimpsed otherwise. And in point of fact, I found what was revealed to me by the sessions with the couple about Ron's marriage was its shocking variance for anything I would have predicted I would learn. Let me begin with the most foundational discovery. It amazed me to learn that Pearl had no desire to divorce Ron. The day she first appeared in my office, I had been certain that the revelation of Ron's odious behavior would of course had, have had Pearl running to the divorce attorney, but it, she, it did not. She showed up often crying to tell him how much she loved him and how much his children did also. She praised him for having been a wonderful husband. She praised him for being an exceptionally caring, involved and loving father. She, all, she so wished for and looked forward to a time when Ron might again be with his family for occasional evenings and all of them could enjoy their established customs and rituals attached to having a meal, to play time and to getting the children ready for bed. Pearl lived with the hope, wanting to imagine a future in which Ron would rise out of being an ugly emotional cripple, be fully restored to his family and just resume living with him and all the serene, ordinary and both lovely and somewhat boring simple moments that characterized the scripts of domesticity. Pearl kept asking me if her hopes could be possible. The best I could do without bursting her bubble of wish wishing was to mutter in my terrible doubt, I can't tell yet. Ron had to ready himself to enter prison. He told two lies. Ron told his employer that he had come into a large family inheritance and was going to take several months away from work, work to help his mother in Santa Barbara to settle the affairs of the estate. 
he would understand that his player would probably replace him and he knew he could not count on having his job back if, if and when he might feel ready and interested in resuming in career in the coding and software management world where he worked. Ron told his children he had to go away for work. He would be gone for several months. He would write them at least twice every week. His son cried bitterly and so did his wife because Ron would be leaving. And Ron had to hear the lacerating pain of the child sobbing, you don't love me. My client got some time off for good behavior and was the last release of incarceration. I held my breath trying to help him to pick up again the previous good pieces of his life. He had been very effective, hardworking, and a well-loved director of software development. His former, former employer had not been able to hire anyone who fit as well as Ron and was overjoyed to have him back at his old job. Getting him home was harder. His so social worker from DCFS was skeptical that he could live with his children and not molest them. I spoke for him saying I thought it was achievable. Pearl spoke to her and reassured the young woman, woman that she would never leave Ron alone with his son and daughter, although it was only the daughter who was at risk. I was able to seal the deal with a very creative solution. The problem that was the sticking point with the worker was that Ron might be able to sneak out of bed in the wee hours while Pearl was deep asleep. I told Pearl to buy an old cast iron headboard for their double bed and to find and purchase a pair of handcuffs. Every night when Ron went to bed, she handcuffed him to the headboard. If he had to get up in the night, she would release him and accompany him to the bathroom bring him back again and lock him up again. After a year with no further reported difficulties and no moments when Ron was alone with his daughter, DCFS closed their files on Ron. But what were the focus of the conversations I was having with Ron in his now two sessions a week, resumed once again after he was out of jail? First and most importantly, I learned about, about, a lot about the hideous trauma that had deformed my client. He was the grandson of one of the richest robber barons of the period around the turn of the 20th century in the United States. The family owned mansions in Newport, Rhode Island and in Montecito, California. His mother was an exceptional beauty and attracted the attentions, uh, the attentions of a young scion from a second, almost as rich family as the two celebrated their nuptials. And that's as far as I have written, so I will go on repeating as best I can my memories of the case. <clears throat> he was the first of three children. They had two more. Uh, he had two younger sisters. Uh, the gap between him and the second child was about six years. During those six years, his mother and father were important social socialites. They loved to go to social functions. They loved to hold dances and entertainments in the family mansion. They loved to travel extensively. And Ron was essentially raised by a nanny, almost by birth, because his mother had not much time, attention, or interest in raising children. And she came from a tradition in the wealthy families that she had descended from, that it was nannies who did the hateful work of raising children. And parents played with them occasionally when they felt like it, but they weren't to be burdened and interfered with by the young wife. They, they would trust the, the wise, uh, hiring of some nanny to do things well. Well, the nanny came and she was very intelligent. She spoke French and she spoke English and uh, she uh, seemed to be a no-nonsense no person who would train and watch over the son very well. And the parents had no way of knowing that she had a secret and kinky sexual life. Uh, the, the nanny had a lover and the lover lived in Montecito also. and. When the parents were out of town, she would invite the lover to come and take up residence with her and her quarters on the, on, the, on the premises. 
and they would play sex games with my client as their toy. They would do threesomes in bed with his little boy from early infancy, and he would be sucked and he would be licked and he would be between them while they fucked. And when he got older, they would have him, they would have the baby, the young the toddler go down on them and lick their genitals as a fun game. And he went on and on as their sex toy. And it did not stop until he was about eight years of age, even after his siblings were born. And he felt broken, he felt damaged, uh, he felt soiled, uh, and he never told anybody until he told me about what had happened to him when he was small. From my perspective, since I came to appreciate developmental psychology very, very, uh, at a very early age, I was interested in the nature of his, quote, perversion, close quotes. Strangely enough, he was stuck in a very strange way, developmentally. He was not doing anything to penetrate the genitality, uh, genitalia of little girls. And uh, his niece was not his only victim. He, he would often capture kids outside of the school grounds and take them off somewhere offering them candy. And once again, he had many, many victims over the years of his life. Not one did he penetrate, neither with his fingers nor with his genitalia. He seemed to get some kind of strange thrill out of sim simply inspecting the genitalia, looking at them. They seemed interesting to him and beautiful to him. And he felt sexual arousal just being a voyeur looking at genitals. Uh, he also started to, to acquire pornography. In the beginning, it was of course in uh, going to sex shops and, and getting the forbidden magazines that were in the back of sex shops. But he, came an, he became an expert on uh, child porn that was coming mainly from Scandinavia. Lots of pictures of naked girls and lots of, lots of pictures of naked girls uh, just standing there exhibiting their genitals. He did not like child pornography when where some adult was actually engaged in some kind of sexual interchange with the children. He liked only looking. So I, I felt a little bit softer towards him. He really wasn't doing hideous harm to the, the to the little girls. He wasn't violating their bodies. He was only looking at their bodies. And uh, in some ways, he was like another small child because that's what small children do. They, they undress in front of each other and look at each other. They don't do much to each other. He was obviously a case of badly arrested development that had, he had been traumatized about all things sexual uh, uh, by the strange encounter he had had with the, uh, the uh, nanny and her boyfriend. I was really surprised that he could consummate the sexual act with his wife and actually father two children. And he confessed to me that the only way he could get excited and really perform sexually in bed was to daydream that he was looking at some little girl's genitals and he was getting excited doing that. Uh, having grown up sexuality was a turnoff for him. He had no, no real erotic interest in doing that. Uh, so my compassion for him was growing by leaps and bounds. Also, he seemed genuinely dedicated to several things. One thing was he would keep his promise in space Place. He was not going to molest his daughter. And second of all, he was going to overcome his addiction. And that's how he started to talk about it. It was an addiction. And he began to read 12 step literature and he began to ask himself, why don't I treat this like an addiction? If people can get over being trapped, having to have alcohol over and over again, I can get over being trapped having to look at children's genitalia over and over again. And he screwed up his courage and he decided that he would go to Sex Addicts Anonymous, which was now a rising organization. And he would talk about his problem of compulsively having to look at little girl's genitals. That was his version of his sex addiction. And he walked into his first meeting and they wanted to kill him. 
what is he doing? He's not a sex addict. He's a fucking pervert. A sex addict is somebody who fucks too much or who masturbates too much. Anybody who's playing around with little girls deserves to be killed or put in jail. And he, he would talk about having been put in jail and he doesn't see why he can't come to meetings and talk about the intensity of his compulsion and, and get the comfort of the group. They wanted nothing to do with them. He got kicked out of one sex addicts anonymous group after another. And he decided, well, he knew something about software. The internet was growing. He even knew about the dark web because there were all kinds of pornography sites on the dark web, including child porn sites. Maybe, maybe he could start his own chapter of Sex Addicts Anonymous that was directed toward child molesters and not towards other kinds of, quote, sex addicts. And he would advertise it on the dark web so that uh, uh, people could come and they wouldn't have to be frightened that the, they would be reported to the police because everybody there would be the, the same pickle and everybody would be at the same risk. And gradually, gradually, he started to build a network of Sex Addicts Anonymous meetings for people whose sex addiction was molesting children and, and not the ordinary things that Sex Addicts Anonymous uh, dealt with. Uh, and uh, he, he was very happy. He, he got his token at the end of one year and he was being very stern with itself. It wasn't enough that he hadn't, hadn't actually gone and tried to molest any girl. He was trying to give up looking at pornography too. So he considered it a slip that he had to confess about it if he even looked at child porn, if he even resorted to the kinds of things he used to look at to stimulate his own masturbation. He was going to make a clean break with his past and overcome it. I began to find him incredibly dedicated and heroic. After a while, he actually started going around giving public lectures and says, starting saying in public to the lay public, I am a sex addict and my addiction is I have molested little girls. And he would own it. He said, I've gone to jail for it. And I'm trying to start a movement where we struggle to overcome this and rejoin the human race and get accepted back into the fold of humanity because we have this under control, just like people can achieve sobriety with other forms of addiction, with cocaine addiction and with alcohol addiction. We don't want to be outcasts for the rest of our existence. We, we want to be human again. So I began to fully appreciate my work with him. He was straightforward with me. I admired him. The person I found loathsome and wished that he would die even and get the hell out of my life became quite heroic to my way of thinking. And maybe one of the hardest working and most challenged and show up again over and over again if I fail and get on top of this possible. I, I saw him for the last time recently, because he stayed in touch with me, we stopped seeing each other regularly. I had two more episodes of care that I'll talk about, but he was doing fine. Uh, and I saw him the last time and he had been quote, clean and sober for 20 years. He had molested no little girls in that period of time. He had looked at no child pornography again at all. He had managed to ride over the top of his addictions and was still a leader in the movement to do something for people who molested children. I had a, after I had not seen him for about 15 years, he came back because he had a serious problem with alcoholism and uh, somehow uh, he was going to AA as well as continuing his work in Sex Addicts Anonymous. And uh, it, would, it would help him, he think, just to talk to me, for me to give him some support while he got rid of the alcohol, which he did do successfully. Uh, during the same period of time he was giving up the alcohol, he wanted uh, to do two things. He, he knew he had not fully fulfilled uh, the one of the, I think it's the 12th step, I forgot, no, it may be the 10th step, the making of amends for arm he had done because of his addiction. 
and he wanted to get in touch with his niece who would have nothing to do with him. And uh, uh, she he had not seen that family or that, she was now a young woman, of course. And he wanted to apologize to her and she would have nothing to do with him. And he asked me, email was, was now present, could he show me a copy of what he wanted to tell her in an email since she wouldn't have anything to do with him. And uh, he apologized in the email. He, he, he said that he had taken advantage of her. He probably hurt, wounded her for life. And he was making an economic offer to her. He thought if she hadn't already, she'd go into therapy. And he, he was willing to pay the cost of her therapy, even if she went into therapy and stayed in therapy for the rest of her life. It was the least he could do to make amends to her for the harm he'd caused her. And the second thing he wanted to do was he wanted to tell his children about his past. He wanted to tell them he hadn't gone away during that period of time when he abandoned him. He'd gone to jail because he was a child molester. Right? This had been kept a secret from him all the years. And he said he needed to be real and own himself. And he needed to see if they could, they could appreciate him and let him be and still welcome him as a father. So he screwed up his courage. It took him a few more years, but he came in to tell me he had told his children and he was crying because they had recoiled in horror and said they, they didn't they they had left the house by then they had graduated college and were out on their own they didn't know what kind of relationship with any they have with their father uh, after hearing information about who their father was and his poor wife was crying worrying that this has created a permanent breach in the family well after two months and both the kids went into therapy. They welcomed him back and told him that what he had done was probably the bravest thing they could imagine him doing under the circumstances. And they believed what he said, that he was no, doing no harm to anybody anymore, that he had tried to rehabilitate himself as best as possible. And he was welcomed back into their lives. And they've been steadfast and very loving with him ever since. And the third time I saw him was just recently uh, he was back again because his mother had finally died and uh, there was a huge war that was starting in the family. Uh, he, he was left as the executor of the will. Uh, his two sisters had never married and his mother had made a more generous bequest to him because he had a wife and grandchildren. And she was, since the, the daughters never married, she, there were no heirs on that side of the family to give bequests to. But the bequests were, in the case they should get married, have grandchildren, they were entitled to ask if they never uh, got married, never happened to grandchildren, then his grandchildren, her grandchildren through him would inherit several more million dollars. And they were gonna contest the will and it started to get ugly. And they were accusing him of having un unduly influenced her and when she made her final will in the, in the year before she died and they were gonna take away his right to be the executive of the estate and to decide what to do with the family homes. Uh, they wanted them preserved, he wanted to sell them. It was his right to do that if he wanted to and to liquidate the proceeds from the sale of both mansions uh, equally according to the distribution of the other capital in the state. And they were making his life miserable. He was hauled into court. Uh, he was threatened with blackmail that uh, his sisters were gonna uh, give a newspaper interview about what a pervert he had been and how their brother had uh, gone to jail. And even though this was a matter of public record, they were gonna get notoriety for him. And he and his wife would have to be ashamed of what the neighbors were gonna think. And uh, he, he was uh, tempted to uh, give them whatever they wanted. At a basic minimum, he already had about $6 million in inheritance and gifts he had gotten over the years. Uh, he was gonna settle for two more million and they were gonna walk away with 12 or $14 million. They offered him a settlement and he was gonna bail. And what did I think? And I said, from my perspective, you have plenty for you and your wife to live comfortably for the rest of your life. 
I know you like working and keep working. You never have to work again. Your children will come into an inheritance. I'm sure you're not going to go through all that money. It's mental health money. Let let the rotten sisters have what they want. You don't need it, and you'll be you'll be at peace, open ended from now on. You never have to talk to them again, and you can go about your business. So that's where we left off, and uh, that oh, I also found out from him because I sent somebody to him. I, I came across an, uh, a teenager, a teenage boy who was molesting girls. And he was taking on as a sponsor in the movement he had started, lots of young people. He was trying to help to join the movement and overcome their uh, addiction. And he agreed to see uh, the, the client of one of my colleagues and make the refer we made the referral to him he, he was going to take the kid under his wing if, if the kid was interested in listening to his experiences and what was possible in terms of taming the demon that was inside he had about 20 young people he was mentoring and and when they were upset he was running to their houses or having them come to talk to him so they wouldn't act out what, what was nagging at them he was he had turned into a very admirable citizen so I think I will stop there. That is my story about telling somebody to handcuff <laughs> their husband to the bed. That proved to be the turning point and the path forward in his care, that he could safely return to his home again and resume being a father and a, and a husband. And I will throw this open to any comments. Arthur, I have a series of questions here um for your for your case and and um, um first off uh was there a need to document or report the the previous incidents of um abuse um by ron oh i didn't have to do that he was very forthcoming with the social worker he gave her his whole history and what he was been struggling with he concealed nothing. He was, even though he had horrible shame and guilt, he figured this was an opportunity. This was an opportunity for him to wrestle with himself somehow. And she, she was a, a very decent person. I didn't find her punitive or awful. She was, she was trying to do her job. So he did, was fortunate. He didn't, he didn't find some bitch who was out to get him. Did, did he make amends uh, with the previous victims at all? No, he didn't know their identities. Hmm. I see. Okay. They were strangers. And, and what seemed to help him the most in terms of stopping curing his addiction in your work with him? I think I gave him hope. The fact that I didn't reject him and act unitively towards him and said to him, I'll be with you every step of the way. I'll do what I can for you. And I exuded some kind of false optimism. Maybe he wasn't beyond repair or beyond the pale, that something might be possible for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, mean, I don't the correct, know. Yeah, the corrective emotional response in some way that you gave him kind of the, uh, the sober reality, but you weren't going to abandon him either. Yeah, and I wasn't going to reach coil from him as if he had leprosy and should be sent to well, what is the island that the lepers are sent to? Uh, whatever <laughs> that is. Or, or maybe in some ways is that you understood and were forgiving for, for all the shame that he experienced in his early childhood. Oh, I was very touched by listening to the horrors that have been inflicted on him. And I think he could see that, that I had compassion for him, to understand how his wounds had resulted in terrible behavior on his part. Because I knew that from the literature. I, I knew that the largest portion of people who molest children have been molested themselves. This is a question I think that you've probably answered before in, in our discussions, but uh, um, why do you feel a need to see anyone who wants to see you? Because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a short answer. <laughs> yeah, what I've learned from this one is uh, just hand them off to Arthur again. That's the, uh, the take <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I think it's a complex answer. It's a, it, it's multi-determined. I, I, I've been doing some self-reflection here in the moment of silence since you asked me this question. Mm -hmm. One is, I want to be the smartest kid on the block. So uh, I, I will deal with everybody else's leftovers. They're idiots, they're limited, they don't see the possibilities. And I'm the magic worker who will find my way through the challenge and where everybody else would give up or throw the person away, I will find some sustaining way to make miracles happen. You, you scored the highest on the Stanford Binet. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I visited an experience I had in first grade, I think. Uh, uh, the teacher would be presenting something and then ask some question to the students and we'd put her hands up and I would be appalled at the number of people she would call on who would give the wrong answer. They were volunteering to say something, but it wasn't the right answer. And I knew the right answer. And I would get furious. Why doesn't she just call on me all the time? I'm, I'm the one. Who has the answer? I know what the answer is. We were doing vocabulary one day. We were going over words. One of the, I still remember this. I was seven years old properly. One of the words that we were learning to spell was dust. I don't know why that was on our fucking spelling list. It's only four letters, so it's probably fairly easy to learn to spell dust. And she said, what is dust, she asked us. And people would raise their hands and they would make re, re, ridiculous answers. And she finally called on me and I said, it's a speck of dirt floating in the air. That's what I said. And I was proud of myself. I knew what dust was. <laughs> Why didn't everybody give the right answer? So I like being the smartest kid on the block. That, that's for sure. And... Uh, there is another thing that I visit occasionally. I'm quite capable of a high degree of self-loathing. So I, I'm not sure that I'm forgivable. I think at my core, I don't know if I'm an acceptable person. I, I need reassurance over and over and over again that I'm acceptable. I think I test my wife beyond endurance sometime. <laughs> and uh, uh, she, she gives me the antidotes I need. So I want to be a person who can accept everybody else. I, I don't want anybody to be beyond the pale. I want to give them what I need. That's another thing that drives me, I think. Mm -hmm. Now it's an elegant adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> Freud said surgeons uh, sublimate their sadism into useful activity, hurting, cutting bones, and making blood flow. and Becoming uh, dentists. <laughs> and, and I sublimate my self-loathing by rescuing other people who have self-loathing and giving them the compassion that I want. Is it helping? No, I don't know. I really don't know. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'd be like if I was in some other profession. So I don't know the answer. <laughs> I really don't know. That would be interesting to find out. I'll tell you what, when we meet on Thursday, I'll see if I can create an instrument on which I ask all of you to, to, to express the degree of self-loathing you walk around with. I want to see if my assumption that many of us are in this profession because we're trying to neutralize self-loathing is correct or not, or whether I'm an outlier in my own profession. <laughs> That'll be fun to ask. <laughs> anything else today well then let me take a look at my list let me go back on the screen sharing again and see what I'm going to talk about next week and I'll make that announcement before I There it is. It should be on the screen. Oh yeah, this one's fun. Next week, I'm gonna be talking about working with, uh, with a morbidly obese man who weighed about 420 pounds. 
And my brilliant way of dealing with him is I started demanding that he eat more junk food. That's what I came up with to try and make a path forward. Who the hell would think of that except somebody like me? <laughs> but you'll hear the story next time. Oh, I have that one written too, so it'll be easy to read. All right, I'll get out of screen sharing again and say goodbye to you for today. I'll be back with you next Friday. All right, see you okay. later. Bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. <laughs>